Welcome. This is a case video overview for the City of Coral Springs Police Officers Retirement Plan versus Farfetch. Um, this is what we would call a shareholder derivative suit. So one of the questions that comes up in a case like this is to what extent can the officers of a publicly held company be held accountable for information that is uh, believed um, correctly or incorrectly, subjectively or objectively, to be incomplete or misleading uh, or dishonest. And there are a number of claims commensurate with this lawsuit that we'll be looking at um, that discuss the different ways in which uh, the plaintiffs here are suing, of course, uh, the, the officers in the company, uh, in specific Farfetch, uh, for um, what they believed to be uh, at best incomplete um, and at worst, dishonest and misleading uh, claims about the company's future, about their intentions, about the direction that the operations were heading in, and the ultimate outcome was obviously not a good one, which led to this litigation in the first place. Um, so that's sort of the the underlying um, basis or fundamental uh, foundation of uh, this particular lawsuit. This is, of course, a 2021 lawsuit, so relatively recent from the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York. Uh, we're recording this video in January of 22, um, so again, a relatively recent case. <clears throat> and so a brief review of some specific terms and information before we move forward and, and dive into this case. One of them is just to define a shareholder derivative suit for everyone. This is a class action derivative suit. So it involves uh, many, many of the shareholders that were involved in ownership, uh, public ownership of the company, in this case, Fair, uh, excuse me, Farfetch. Uh, but a shareholder derivative suit at base is just a, a lawsuit that is brought by the shareholders. Um, it could be one or more, and you can opt into this group or not if you happen to be a shareholder. So if you're an owner of a company, you don't have to participate in the suit. It doesn't mean you can stop the other shareholders from doing so, but you don't have to play an active role. You can opt in or opt out just as you would from any other class action. Um, but it's brought by the shareholders to assert a claim belonging to the company itself. Uh, again, of course, the shareholders are the owners, so they represent the company. Uh, and it's against most often the directors and or officers, the managers of that company. And it's usually alleging some type of mismanagement, right? Abuse of discretion, or in some cases, it's a crime like embezzlement or, uh, you know, misuse of company property. Um, but, uh, you know, poor decision making in one form or another is usually an underlying hinge point of a lot of these suits. And that brings me to the second point of review that I just want to make sure we go over um, before we get into uh, the, the, the finite details of the case. Um, and that is to say uh, that when we look at the shareholder derivative suits, a lot of them involve something called the business judgment rule. Now, the claims that we're going to be discussing that are commensurate with the city of Coral Springs uh, Police Department retirement plan case v. Farfetch here involve... Uh, a lot of different uh, theories of liability. Uh, they involve the Securities Act and the Exchange Act, and we'll talk about those and what they require of officers, what they require of IPOs or initial public offerings. Um, but undergirding a lot of this in just a philosophical sense is something known as the business judgment rule, which is the idea in the courts that review these kind of claims that boards and, and typically the officers and directors that occupy those boards are presumed as a matter of, of discourse to act in good faith, that is within their fiduciary duties, right? That duty that concerns loyalty and transparency and honesty and good stewardship of assets and uh, the ownership interests that are involved there, right? A fiduciary duty is a duty to act in the best interest of the owners as, a, as an officer or director of one of these companies. Um, so again, those standards include loyalty, prudence, and care, um, that those directors owe to the stakeholders. Um, absent evidence that a board or a director in particular has blatantly violated one of those duties or the standards or the rules of conduct, the courts will not Monday morning quarterback the counter effects of what could have ultimately been a bad decision, but not necessarily a nefarious one that smacks a violation of a fiduciary duty. So, and it's important to understand this distinction. Right? Because without the business judgment rule, any time an owner was unhappy with a decision or its fallout, you could essentially bring suit and on, on the grounds of, of a claim of um, 
of stupidity or short-sightedness, right, or incompetence in general. Um, and, and this would just absolutely create pandemonium in the legal system for publicly held companies, right? Anytime a, a director, a CEO, an officer, a manager of any publicly held company did anything that panned out in a way that dissatisfied the shareholders, they would be at risk of, of legal liability, potentially personal legal liability stemming from that conduct. And it would discourage anybody from ever wanting to, to manage a company of that kind ever, right? Because the, the, the risk would just be too high. And so what the business judgment rule says is just, look, we're, we're not going to Monday morning quarterback every business decision that's made in the corporate world among publicly held companies. Um, unless you can articulate with specificity uh, and concrete evidence how one of these duties of fiduciary was violated, right? Which usually involves an element of intent, which we'll talk about in this case. Uh, in other words, you know, you could show that there was a, a purposeful intent to do this. Um, then it's difficult to 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 prosecute, in a sense, the the directors of these companies. So, as an example that I, I typically use, just as for the sake of of uh, you know, comprehension of this idea. Uh, if you were to take a company, you know, any large company, you could say GM or Ford or Disney or Coca-Cola, what have you. And, and let's suppose that that there is a um, a, uh, a new technology that emerges, uh, that's innovated or invented, that would allow for the company to potentially uh, reduce its its labor, you know, its workforce by you know some huge margin, ten or twenty percent, and replace them all with machines that are better, faster, cheaper for the bottom line, and would almost invariably result in a, a better P and L, you know, more profit, which means better ownership interest for the shareholders. Okay, and then the 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 CEO of said company looks at this option, you know, he's presented with the technology, he or she, uh, to pursue that, you know, mechanization, the automation and the replacement of human labor. But that person says, you know what, I I I like this, but my heart is too big and I have too much empathy for the people that work here. I care about our employees. I don't want to fire 10 or 20 percent of them. So we're going to pass. Right. We we realize we're going to incur greater costs, but I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, for the employees who help to build this company and they, they keep it running. So we're going to live with the status quo and not pursue this opportunity. Um, that's the kind of situation where if you can show a, a breach of duty where they were acting in interests that are other than to the shareholders, you may in fact have a claim that that passes the business judgment rule, right? That goes beyond the scope of just, hey, it's a bad decision that doesn't pan out because in that scenario that I just provided, you might be able to articulate, assuming that the record is unambiguous and that you know the, the director in question admits to everything I've just I've just described. You know that yeah, you know I, I knew that this would save us money, but I said I'm not going to do it because I, I care about the people too much. And there wasn't some you know ulterior hope uh, down the road that 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 uh, you know caring about the employees would lead to better morale and better productivity that would offset the losses. Uh, if it was just about charity, you know, in the purest sense then there may be a valid shareholder derivative suit for a lack of a violation of fiduciary duty. Because as much as you might feel for that decision and say, well, that sounds altruistic and nice, um, if it's clearly adverse to the interests of the shareholders and their ownership value, um, you don't have the luxury as a director or officer to let your heart guide you in that respect. Right, because you have to think about the people that you are for for whom you're stewarding a company, right? Um, you know, but but an example of where this would apply and exclude a suit would be, you know, here's a real example. There was a um, years and years ago, Netflix tried to split off its mail-in DVD uh, business with a, another company that that I think they were planning to call Quickster. And uh, there was a big announcement about this, and then it was almost immediately repealed. And it was pretty embarrassing at the time because it was—it just looked like the company was entirely dysfunctional and had no clear sense of direction. Um, and, and obviously, in hindsight, this whole Quickster idea was a bad, uh, a, bl a bad plan. It was, you know, looking at obsolete technology and things that were not growing in demand. It didn't make sense. Um, but ostensibly, you know, it was—it was intended to try to improve the value of the company. Right, it wasn't intended to defraud the company. It wasn't intended to enrich the directors or the officers at the expense of the shareholders. It wasn't intended to embezzle. It wasn't intended to commit a crime. It was intended, you know, even in hindsight, to look at it and say it was probably a dumb decision. The the purpose, the the goal of it, 
however you know foolish it was in hindsight was to try to increase shareholder value i mean that's what it was all about was to improve the bottom line of the company it didn't work it ended up being a mess and they walked it back almost immediately um but the the purpose was altruistic right the the, the idea was to be a good fiduciary for those shareholders um even if the net result was to do just the opposite right because i, I think there was a dip in shareholder value uh, stock value following this kind of chaos of of what you know what's happening with our company um but the the question there becomes in a scenario like that do you have a valid claim against the ceo of netflix for a shareholder derivative suit that alleges breach of fiduciary duty that would be tougher right i'm not saying it's impossible but it would be tougher because you'd have this person saying look yes i realize in hindsight that wasn't the best decision but my intentions were good and all of my actions we're in furtherance of my fiduciary duty, which is to say I was genuinely trying to increase shareholder value, trying to, to be good stewards of the company, trying to maintain loyalty and honesty and transparency. We just made a bad call, right? And this would be no different than, um, you know, the the Chevy Nova, if anybody remembers that car and, and how they tried to sell it in Central America. And if you speak Spanish and you know what Nova means and in Spanish, you know why it didn't sell uh, worth a darn in, in Mexico and other parts of Latin America. It was a really bad, short-sighted, um, just unresearched and, and stupid marketing idea. It didn't work because they picked a bad name and they marketed it in the wrong place. Um, but other places, it, it might have done fine. So again, it was in hindsight, they made a mistake. But that doesn't mean that they were exposed to some liability for lack of fiduciary duty because they were still trying to improve the shareholder value and act in the best interest of the owners. Um, they just had a human error, right? And human errors happen all the time. So the whole point of the business judgment rule is simply to say that human errors, innocent human errors that don't have a nefarious underlying intent and, and purpose are not grounds for you to sue your officers and directors and you know gouge them for 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 monies or damages or whatever because you know as, as if they were acting to defraud you or mislead you now the the case before us the far fetch case is not that right what we're looking at is a case where the the shareholders are arguing that there was misleading uh, lack of information misinformation dishonesty lack of transparency uh, and and essentially fraud in some cases right so those if factually true would be grounds for a proper shareholder derivative suit that would pass muster um, but in the absence of that you have you know companies that have to shift and pivot and move with market changes and whatnot and so there's a lot of variables here and that's what we're going to talk about in this case insofar as it relates to the unfolding of of the far-fetched matters and how this sort of all played out so the case history here just to give a background of what happened how it happened why it happened um you have defendant farfetch third-party marketplace platform that connects luxury goods suppliers to consumers on its website so kind of like a like an ebay or an amazon but for luxury goods right so um revenue comes from high commissions that it receives on the sales of these luxury goods so that's the main business model it's described as the uber of luxury fashion right a connection point for those suppliers and consumers um so Farfetch was valued at a billion dollars in 2015 after a round of private funding. So it's still a private company at this point, and it was valued at a billion dollars. Began the process of going public two years later in late 2017. Okay, so this is the time frame we're looking at. It held an IPO roadshow, again, an initial public offering roadshow to generate funding, right? So it drummed up positive press coverage, support for the company, anticipation of earnings, uh, which hopefully leads to a high stock value, increases the market cap of the company, right? So the press and the market saw tremendous potential for growth in the company. So it was a very positive experience for them, right? It, it, it had a high return on investment, that, that roadshow. So that brings us to the initial public offering. Farfetch filed the prospectus registration statement in September, the initial sort of the first step in this process, 2018. Uh, so now we're three years removed from the 2015 uh, time point at which it was valued at a billion dollars. Uh, several prominent banks, including Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, underwrote the IPO, right? So you have backing from significant financial institutions with a lot of clout. Um, its offering documents included representations, uh, touting innovative third-party platform marketplace and distinguishing itself from the first-party sales model, right? So this is uh, this is a point of, of, of arguably competitive advantage and market distinction, and these are important as we'll see 
as we go on in the discussion, because essentially Farfetch was saying, hey, we're different than the first party direct to consumer, uh, either in store or online sales model. We're a third party platform for this. And we have a unique offering that isn't offered elsewhere, which is what gives us an advantage, you know, that's, that, that carves out a niche for us to make money. Um, they also disclosed how they divided the operating segments of their business for accounting purposes. So breaking down their, their revenues uh, and costs into you know, chunks that people can understand in assessing whether or not to invest in the company. And explaining key performance indicators, also known you know, for short as KPIs in business and industry, uh, that represented economic value, right? So uh, what is it that they're, how are they measuring their own performance and what are they targeting is typically what KPIs do. Uh, growth strategies uh, were identified, um, and they stated that they did not have any current plans for future acquisitions at the time of the IPO, right? So again, all of these four points that we just discussed are pivotal to the arguments that are coming forth from the shareholders. So we're going to look at that now. So the IPO aftermath, um, the IPO again was highly successful, and the company achieved a post-IPO valuation of over $8 billion. So that's pretty impressive when you think about, again, uh, 2015 valued at a billion dollars, three years later going through the IPO, now valued at $8 billion. Right? So first reverses of this trend, uh, and obviously, you know, if it was all good, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so you know that this, this went the other way at some point. And those first reverses came in 2019, when the media reacted tepidly to some of its acquisitions of first party sales entities. So there were some acquisitions in 2019, and the media was not thrilled about those, didn't have great things to say or great anticipation of success from them. Right. So uh, Farfetch officials, there's several individuals involved here as, as officers or directors for the company, uh, Nevis, Rob, and Jordan, started to sell off some of their stock, collectively making something like $50 million in profits on the sale of the stock. Um, and then in August 2019, Farfetch disclosed another acquisition of a first party sales entity, which again, seems to be in contradiction to the statements made at the time of the IPO that their, their key distinctive advantage was that third-party marketing platform, which was different from first-party uh, traditional modes of sale. And significantly higher than expected losses were also reported. Okay, so this wasn't good for the company. The stock price fell 45% in the 24 hours after this announcement in 2019, um, which is real bad. So shareholders lost about half their value, right? That's, that's not a great thing at all. And this, is, this was the catalyst for the suit. So the shareholders, again, brought a class action lawsuit against the officials, the company, and the investment banks that underwrote the IPO. So all were listed as named defendants. Uh, the suit alleged various misrepresentations and omissions in the IPO documents, constituting violations of, again, and we mentioned this at the onset, but just to get more specific, the Securities Act, the Exchange Act. So defendants filed a motion to dismiss. We've talked about this in, in plenty of videos before. Uh, a motion to dismiss a 12B6 is a, a dismiss for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So the idea that there's nothing here, right? That this is, this is a motion you file when you think this is a nothing burger and the court should see that even if you look at everything in a light most favorable to the, the person that is not filing the motion, there's nothing that we could do to file, to, to, to to grant relief here, right? That there's no chance of success and that this should be dismissed. So again, the standard for 12B6 can only be granted if accepting all the factual allegations in the complaint is true. The plaintiff is not entitled to relief. So you have to assume everything as alleged is true. So you're looking at it in a light most favorable to the plaintiff. Um, the allegations don't have to necessarily be quote unquote detailed, but they have to state a claim to relief that it is at least plausible, at least conceivable, which means that the content allows the court to draw a reasonable inference that they're, that the defendant might be liable, right, under the circumstances. There has to be a pathway that's conceivable to a victory in the case. Um, in securities fraud cases, the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act requires a complaint, so this is specific to these types of cases, and that complaint has to specify each statement or omission, right, because we might be talking about what the officers did or what they failed to do, right? Alleged to have been misleading. So we have allegations of misleading statements. The reason or reasons why the statement or omission is misleading. And if an allegation regarding the statement or omission is made on information and belief, state with particularity all facts on which that belief is formed, right? So it has to be comprehensive and it has to be clear. That's the main idea here. 
So now we're going to get to the claims and we're going to take a look at what is it that the shareholders are arguing the officers in the company at large did or did not do that was in violation of their fiduciary duties um, or their duties of transparency, their per se statutory duties under the Securities and the Exchange Acts, right? So first, the Exchange Act, the 10B claims, okay? So we're going to look at specifically Section 10B of the rule. Um, it makes it illegal to use or employ in connection with the purchase or sale of any security, any manipulative or deceptive device or contrivance in contravention of such rules and regulations as the commission may prescribe as necessary or appropriate in the public interest or for the protection of, events or, uh, of investors. Um, so it makes it illegal for you to use anything that deceives or misleads or misinforms the shareholders in such a way that would make it improbable or impossible for the public to know, to understand what's going on so that they can actually decide whether to invest or not. So rule 10b-5 specifically, so this is a subsection of 10b, clarifies a point. Uh, you cannot make any untrue statement of a material fact or omitting to state a material fact uh, necessary in order to make the statements made in the light of the circumstances under which they were made, not misleading, right? So a, a, a statement or an omission that would make something misleading at the end of the day. That's what we're after. And materially misleading, right? A material fact, materially misleading. What does that mean? It means significant, right? Not trivial, not tangential, but really important to the overall picture. The question is, would a reasonable investor, we're going to see that word in a minute here, reasonableness, would a reasonable investor be able to make competent, good, informed decisions based on the information, or would they be reasonably misled into thinking something that wasn't true? That's the crux that underpins a lot of these arguments. So 10B requirements, the elements are uh, in connection with the purchases of sales or securities, uh, purchase, purchase or sale of, of different types of securities, acting with scienter, which is the knowledge of the falsity, right? It, this kind of rings of a little bit of, of, of like a defamation claim almost is that you have to know that what you're saying is either misleading or untrue. If you don't have knowledge that that particular thing is, is untrue, then there may be a claim as to, you know, whether or not there was intent there or whether or not you're, you're truly culpable. So if I, you know, speak out of turn about something of which I have no knowledge, um, I, I don't have any reason to believe that it isn't true, but I also don't have any reason to believe that it is. And this is where it becomes complicated. Do I have reason to believe that what I'm saying is not true? Um, that's the question. False material representation or omission to disclose material information. Again, either a statement or an omission. And the plaintiff's reliance caused the plaintiff injury. So there has to be causation and injury. That's similar to the elements of negligence when you think about it, right? You have to show injury without which you'd lack standing to sue in the first place because what are you here for, right? And, and you have to show that there was a causation element, an element that ties the misleading elements or actions or omissions with your injury, right? So we're going to look at that now. Um, where fraudulent intent cannot be completely proven, an inference of fraud can be established by showing a motive and opportunity to commit fraud or by showing strong circumstantial evidence or conscious misbehavior or recklessness. So again, notice here that you have intent or recklessness. And this, I kind of think about like in the context of murder, right? To keep it a, a, a uh, to use an analogy that might be useful. So if you think about uh, first degree versus second degree murder, first degree murder is always premeditated, right? With intent, with purpose, uh, with forethought, right? You wanted to do this. This was your intention and that's what happened. Second degree murder, we often think of murder as intentional killing, but second degree murder is often referred to as like depraved heart or reckless indifference murder. So in other words, a, a, an individual could be convicted of a second degree murder without necessarily an intent element, right? Without having to prove that they wanted to bring about the, the element which was brought about, right? Bring out the consequences of their actions. But they do have to act with such a strong degree of recklessness or depravity that they should have known that this would have been a likely uh, result, right? And the same here, you're seeing this sort of binary uh, variable with respect to the elements to establish the fraud necessary for the 10B claim. Either they intended to commit fraud or they were so reckless as to not care about the quality of what they were saying and the veracity of what they were saying as to have known that this might have caused the, the, the problems and the injuries that it did. 
right? So again, if, if, um, you know, if I, uh, you know, say to a friend of mine that I think, uh, you know, my other friend is a, is a rapist, right? And I have no information whatsoever to support or refute that, right? I don't know that my friend is a rapist or not. I, I, I haven't followed him around his whole life, so it's possible, but I also don't have any reason to believe it otherwise, right? So I have nothing to go on there. I'm just saying things. Well, again, it may not be my intention to commit fraud if I believe in my heart it's true, however misguided it might be, right? If, if I'm sincere about it at the moment, uh, even if that's irrational. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm certainly acting recklessly, right? With respect to the statements that I'm making, because again, I, I don't have any evidence to support that. Uh, in the absence of that evidence, this is a, a callous and reckless choice to say something with no support, with no reason to believe that it's true. And, and for that, again, I could be guilty of the crime of defamation uh, or, or civil charges related to defamation uh, associated with you know, my actions. Because again, even if I did not intend to say something untrue, I didn't have any reasonable uh, basis to believe it was true. And therefore, my actions were reckless, right? So that's what we're looking at uh, on this basis here. So for motive and opportunity, uh, the plaintiffs, the shareholders here argued that these elements, motive and opportunity, were shown by the trading done by the officials, the officers, Nevis, Jordan, and Rob, in advance of the disastrous August disclosure. So what they're saying is they bailed out, right? They're saying, look at look at all of the stock they sold off before this happened, right? And And isn't that opportunistic? Isn't that suspicious that they did this just before the company uh, collapsed and imploded in on itself. And that shows bad faith. It shows motive and opportunity. It establishes those circumstances. Um, insider stock sales, especially you run into issues with insider trading, right? That That's a whole nother claim, not necessarily pursued in this litigation, but you run into issues about, you know, as an officer of a company, if you hold stock, you're privy to insider information. You can't liquidate that stock right before a major announcement when you have reason to know that your stock will be affected one way or another by it. That's, you know, this is the, the Martha Stewart case all over again, if you remember that from years ago. Uh, so insider trading is a big no-no, but that's kind of uh, peripheral to what we're talking about here, but it's important. So insider stock sales at prices inflated by false statements or omissions can constitute evidence of fraud. So here we're talking about, again, fraud. Um, however, just showing executive stock sales on its own is insufficient evidence of fraud. So just because somebody sold stock doesn't mean, I mean, that every time an executive of a company sells stock in that company, that it's, a, you know, it's evidence of some type of fraudulent behavior, clearly, right? So we need more than that. So the question is what? You would need to show some evidence that the stock sale by the insider is made under circumstances that suggest maximizing personal benefit from that inside information. Again, that's, that's that insider trading basis for this fraud claim, right? Uh, for example, it could be shown that this pattern of training is dramatically out of line with prior trading practices for the officials. So this is a, a hypothetical here, but what the, what the analysis is saying is if you could suggest that, well, with respect to Nevis and Jordan and Rob, if this particular sale immediately prior to the announcements in August that tanked the company's stock, if that was totally out of character for them, then that might be further evidence of some type of, of nefarious trading that, that reeks of fraud. Right. But if it's consistent, if they have consistently sold a hundred shares of their stock a day for the last 100 days, and then on the date in question that you're suspicious of, they sold a hundred shares, that's not out of character, right? It's part of the routine stuff that they've been going on doing for months now. And it would be unreasonable for you to suggest that that was uh, opportunistic if it's the same thing they've been doing every day for, for three and a half months, right? So, the analysis here, in our case, a lockup agreement made the officials ineligible to sell their stock until March 20th of 2019. So there was actually, in addition to insider trading laws that will prohibit stock sales within certain windows of time and, and certain policies and companies, um, there was an agreement within the company that prohibited these individuals from bailing out on the company. And that's not uncommon in publicly traded companies, especially new publicly traded companies because they want to make sure that the executives that are that are essential to the growth and, and stability of the company do not just, you know, make a killing in the first six months and then jump ship and leave everybody else to sink and, and drown. Right. So that's pretty common. But the point here being they couldn't sell their stock at all until March 20th, 2019. They were contractually prohibited from doing that. Right. Um, it also limited their ability to sell their shares incrementally even after that. Right, so there was only so much they could do. They couldn't dump everything at once. Um, 
So essentially their ability to sell their own stock was heavily regulated by the terms of their agreements with the company Farfetch. Right? So since this was their first opportunity to sell off the shares when they did it, right? The $50 million profit sale that we discussed earlier and the amount they could sell was specified by their agreements. It's difficult to argue that their trading pattern was unusual or highly suspicious. So again, the, the amount they sold was in line with the prior stipulated contractual agreements that they had with the company. And this was the first opportunity to sell off shares. So of course, you're not going to have any historical stock sales uh, to look back and sort of judge uh, routine or habit of, of stock trading because they weren't allowed to sell any prior to that point. This was the first opportunity. So there's really, that, that would not be a fair argument to say, well, look, this is the only time they did it. Well, yeah, it was the only time that they could do it, right? That's the key here. Um, the amounts of the trades are also not necessarily unusual, right? So this is a, a, a key point worth considering is that um, they're, they're, they're not out of scope for publicly traded companies and executives. While they might've sold stock worth over 60 million in total, the company already had a billion dollars in funding and a market cap of, of over 6 billion. So it's important to keep things in context because you hear $60 million worth of stock and you say, geez, they, they clearly just dumped everything and left. But again, the company was worth billions. So on that scale, $60 million suddenly is not nearly as big a slice of the pie as it would be compared with, say, my checking account or your checking account, right? So these are the, the things we need to keep in perspective. So continuing the analysis, moreover, the two defendants uh, of the three executives that were named in the suit kept the vast majority of their holdings. So uh, two of the three executives didn't sell off much of the stock that they had actually held in the company. The third person sold about half of their company stock. And even that third defendant who sold half the stock also left the company shortly after the trades, establishing yet another plausible reason for that person's large trades aside from insider knowledge. So they departed immediately or, or shortly thereafter selling the stock. So that presents a reason or a motive why they might have done that uh, aside from some fraudulent pursuit of, of uh, again, defrauding investors and defrauding owners. So evidence also suggested that the defendant planned their trades well in advance of the spring and summer of 2019. So this was not an, uh, a spur of the moment spontaneous thing. This was something, there was evidence in record that suggested that this was strategic and that it had been planned for, for uh, months prior to its execution, which would uh, contradict any notion that there was a sudden downturn in the market or an anticipated downturn in the market that led to an impulse sell of shares to avoid suffering the losses, right? The corrective disclosures in August, the ones that tank the company stock, are not obviously linked to these trades, therefore, because they were planned so far in advance. So that's the point of, of the, the precursor planning that shows evidence that that predated this whole concern about the announcements that were made in August. Um, all in all, there's simply not enough evidence upon which to infer that the trades were linked to insider knowledge or lies or omissions. So in terms of we've, we've established motive and opportunity is probably not there, but what about the element of conscious misbehavior or recklessness? In other words, were they acting in such a, uh, an unreasonable way so as to give rise to a presumption of fraud here. Uh, that's the other way that we can establish this, right? As we discussed earlier. So plaintiff's theory of conscious misbehavior recklessness is that the defendants deliberately hid first party sales, uh, constant promotions, major planned acquisitions, and other issues from the public in order to further a false narrative about the nature of Farfetch's business. That they did this on purpose. This is, you know, with respect to their, their conduct, that there is an element of intent as implied by the term deliberately, right? But that there was also just this this um, false narrative being spread about Farfetch's business to the investors to uh, deceive them about the true nature. But the court looked at that in this case, and ultimately, they disagreed with this uh, assessment of what happened. So the court found that the, uh, the executives in question, they did disclose that first party sales and acquisitions could be part of the revenue streams. So there was nothing in the uh, pre-IPO or the IPO literature that said, you know, we we promise we will never invest in first party acquisitions, uh, that that's not something we'll we'll ever do or that we, ne or even that we never plan to do it, right? That that, that that was disclosed that it could be and would be a part of it. Um, 
Even if the disclosures were incomplete, the defendants put the market on notice as to their possible potential strategies. So they, again, there was a disclosure about it. And so it can't be shown that they acted with conscious misbehavior or recklessness. So there was a disclosure of that piece. Um, the claim under Section 10B, therefore, must be dismissed. <clears throat> so that's the exchange claim, uh, the Exchange Act claim, as we discussed earlier. Now we move to the Securities Act claim. Um, and this relates to statements about the different operating segments within the business and the extent to which those potentially were misleading in ways that the shareholders feel uh, were, were deceptive or fraudulent in such a way as to violate a fiduciary duty. Um, so the Securities Act Clause of Action, the Act provisions allow a cause of action for any person acquiring the security offered pursuant to a misleading registration statement. Right, so uh, it it allows a lawsuit to go forward if you can show that the registration statement was misleading. It also applies to statements in the prospectus that accompanies uh, the the pre IPO and the IPO itself. Right, so anything that's been put out into the public that might be materially misleading might be fair game for a cause of action under this section of the Securities Act. Right, so the statement uh, in order to be to satisfy the Securities Act for a cause of action here must contain an untrue statement of material fact, uh, must omit to state a material fact required to be stated therein, or must omit to state a material fact necessary to make the statement therein not misleading. So again, same basic standards as we've been discussing now repeatedly uh, over you know several different points in this conversation. It's an act or a statement or an omission, right, of a statement or an act that leads to a reasonable presumption that someone, you know, in the in the shoes of a of a prospective investor would have been misled, right? Reasonably so, not you know someone that's extremely gullible and prone to, uh, you know, delusions and grandeur. We're talking about a reasonable investor would have been misled in a material way by materially um, impactful statements or omissions, right? So even if statements are not literally false, uh, again, it's measured not by literal truth, but by the ability to accurately inform rather than mislead prospective buyers. The ultimate question is whether a reasonable investor would have been misled. So again, we've been using that term repeatedly, reasonable. It is the, the legal fiction of a reasonable person standard. I mean, and in this context, of course, we're just applying it to a reasonable investor, right? If you have a slip and fall case in a, in a shopping mall or something, the question becomes, you know, would a reasonable person have seen the, the soda that had spilled or, you know, the, the rabid dog that was about to bite them on the butt or what have you. So here we're talking about would a reasonable investor have been deceived by the practices, the statements, or the omissions that are called into question here. So with respect to the operating segments and the discussion thereof and the prospectus and the registration statement, the offering materials that were disclosed said that the company's operating segments included stores uh, and, and specifically operation of the Browns luxury boutiques. Um, Browns was a first party retailer. So this is more evidence of you know intent to engage in first party sales and acquisitions. Um, Plaintiffs alleged that this was misleading because the statement uh, split its revenue from, from Browns into e-commerce and in-person commerce segments so that there was a divide between these two on the accounting material that was provided in the prospectus, right? So the shareholders are claiming that Farfetch did this intentionally to deceive, that the purpose of this was to hide the fact that Browns was such an enormous source of Farfetch's revenue. And apparently it was a, a pretty dominant piece of the pie. And they're saying the executives, the officers, the people that were running the company didn't want us to know that. Otherwise, we would not have seen such potential value in the company and would not have invested and it wouldn't have been worth $8 billion immediately post IPO. Farfetch had claimed in its documents that its model was superior to first party retail. And so it would have been embarrassing to show that so much of its revenue came from a first party retail uh, subsidiary. So the idea behind this was that, yes, we split it up for strategy reasons, but not to defraud, but to indicate that, you know, again, we, we, we're arguing that we have a competitive advantage, a, a point of material distinction over first party retailers. And in, in presenting the data this way, although it's, it's not lying, right. But it's, it's the way in which we chose to organize it, um, was in such a way as to show an, the advantage that we're trying to highlight for the purposes of selling our, our, uh, our pitch here, which ultimately is the company itself, right? So plaintiffs claim that this was a material misstatement, that it amounts to misleading and, and to fraud, right? 
Um, so Farfetch expressly disclosed the revenue from Browns, um, and there was no uh, disputing the accuracy of that. Right? There's no arguments here that it wasn't true or accurate, or that the, the real numbers weren't presented. Right? That there was any doctoring of the financial um, figures. Even if it split it amongst different categories, according to the court, uh, it had disclosed all the information about its revenue from Browns accurately. And again, no one was disputing that. And even if the splitting of the categories was a bit misleading, a reasonable investor in the eyes of the court would not be misled into thinking it relied less on first party sales than it did, since again, all the revenue information was disclosed. And it may have been put into different uh, buckets, but but the buckets were not mislabeled, right? It's not like they lied about the categories. They may have just spread them out in such a way that, uh, you know, it, it may not have been as clear as it would have otherwise. And ultimately, a lot of that comes down to aesthetic choices for how to organize things, even within the context of something like, uh, you know, financial disclosures and public reporting in accordance with Sarbanes-Oxley right, for publicly held companies. There are decisions about accounts, right, cost accounts and revenue accounts, and how do you organize those, right? So, you know, a, a classic example would be, um, you know, if, if GM wants to report revenue figures, well, should GM report revenue figures for, for, for one category labeled cars, or should GM report revenue figures for, uh, you know, six different uh, categories that include Cars, trucks, SUVs, minivans, and, you know, two more uh, consumer, uh, you know, economy cars and luxury cars or what have you, you name the categories. And either way they go, is there a criticism that, that the financial statements produced, as long as the numbers are ultimately correct, either in the aggregate or split up separately, are misleading or dishonest? Obviously, the answer would be no. But either way, you might be vulnerable to attack from somebody who says, well, I really wanted to see this in the aggregate. I wanted, I, I didn't want you to split it up into nine different car categories. I wanted you to just tell me how much you made on, on automobiles in general, right? Or you have someone who says, well, no, that's, that's not um, the, pro the, the appropriate way to do this. The appropriate way would be to split them up so we can see what your different specific market segments look like. So it's kind of a, in a certain way, it's kind of a catch-22 with respect to the ways that these things are organized. But the court here clearly siding with the, uh, the defendants and the company is saying, look, they disclosed everything. It's not like they omitted something or they left something out of their revenue figures or they distorted the numbers. They didn't inflate them. They didn't uh, you know, change them from their actual numbers. They just chose to group them in such a way as to work in the direction of the, the, the sales pitch for their company, which isn't necessarily misleading in the eyes of the court, as long as you're disclosing everything and you're not being dodgy about you know, the, the categories or, or mislabeling them or lying about where the revenue is coming from. Um, ultimately here that the shareholders just didn't like the way the information was organized. Um, plaintiffs also alleged that the splitting violated financial reporting standards. Again, we talked about that just a moment ago. Court said ultimately this didn't matter, even if it did, as reporting standards are only relevant in a securities fraud claim to the extent that they make the information uh, misleading or false. Right, so the different type of, of uh, lawsuit, and again, even in this context, the court is saying that this information was not misleading or false. So the same standard applies, and and the court would would have applied the same rule of law in this case as well. Again, the extent to which this information was misleading, and they've already opined that they did not find this organization of information misleading. So thus, the the securities claim uh, for that specific aspect was dismissed. Um, now we move to yet another claim, which is a statement, uh, a secu another Securities Act claim. This is with respect to statements about the business model, right? How were they expecting to make money? What were they expecting to do in the future? Those kinds of questions. And again, the shareholders arguing that the the prospectus and the registration statements were misleading with respect to what was expected to happen. So the offering documents described Farfetch's business model as a primarily uh, third-party marketplace platform. For example, statements that were included, Farfetch is a technology company. Uh, the marketplace model allows the company to incur minimal inventory risk. It allows an ability to maximize margins uh, more so than first party retailers. And it relies primarily on a revenue share model where the company would retain commissions, right? So these are all statements that came from those materials. And the plaintiffs, the shareholders, argued that these were misleading because they obscured the degree to which the company was actually driving, uh, deriving its revenue from first-party sellers. They're saying all of this was 
uh, engineered to hide the fact that this was primarily a first party seller oriented and dependent company. Um, but the, the statements were specifically designed in such a way as to deceive us from knowing about that or realizing it, right? So court's analysis of these claims, uh, court says first, none of the statements were false. So again, getting back to same argument as the revenue figures in the, in the organization of, of revenue uh, statements in the, in the materials, they're saying none of it was untrue, right? None of it was doctored or, uh, or, or false statements. The company did engage in all the strategies discussed. Uh, secondly, it disclosed that it engaged in first party sales and correctly reported all the revenue, as we discussed previously. Uh, third, many of these big picture and strategic statements fall under the category of puffery. This is really a nebulous area with respect to uh, lawsuits like this about, uh, again, it could be fraud with respect to publicly held companies. It could be defamation. It could be a lot of things. Um, but puffery is primarily a marketing term. Right. This refers to statements that are typically marketing oriented and usually too general to cause a reasonable investor to rely on them. So the court observed that the claim, for example, that the company is a technology company at its core is the kind of, in the eyes of the court, vague corporate speak that no reasonable investor would rely on in any significant way. So essentially what the court is saying in describing this language as puffery is, what does that even mean? And what would that reasonably cause you to think about the company that would result in detrimental reliance on some interpretation, right? It's a technology company at its core. What does that lead you to mean or to take away from that statement that would lead to a, a presumption of a material misrepresentation, right? So other examples of puffery are, you know, if you go into a bagel shop, right, and they have a sign in the window that says world's best bagels, right? Well, according to who, right, as evaluated by what agency, you know, the, the, the world bagel, uh, bagel authority, you know, it's, it's it, clearly that is a statement that is marketing puffery, right? And, and they may not even have won any objective third party award for world's best bagels. You may ask the company and they may say, yeah, that's according to us, right? Um, but does that mean that they're, they're liable for misrepresentation or fraud because a company puts, you know, world's best donuts or world's best bagels or world's best um, you know, anything in, in the, in the marketing literature for the products and services that they provide? Of course not. Right. So this is the kind of thing that amounts to puffery, which is, again, it's marketing oriented. It's vague enough. It's not specific, right? It doesn't say that, um, you know, our, our, for example, going back to the bagel store that the silly analogy I just described, if the, the bagel store had put a sign in the window that said our bagels have uh, f less fat and fewer calories than every other bagel provider in the, you know, in the, in the country, right? Well, that's an objective and specific statement that either could be true or false factually in such a way as to be unambiguous, right? I mean, we could, we could grab a bagel from other bagel competitors, right? And then we could test them and determine which have more fat and more calories. And so either that's true or false, right? And, and or we have the lowest prices, you know, than, than, you know, lower than everybody else. Well, again, even there, you know, if you're saying lowest prices, okay, that's, you know, specific in certain contexts, but it's also in a certain sense, part of the, the classic marketing jargon that is used in every industry. How often do you see a sign when you walk into anywhere, whether it's a grocery store um, or, a, you know, the shopping mall and you see something that says, you know, lowest prices. I mean, you see that language all the time. Does that mean that if you can find a price for the same product that's lower, you can sue them for, you know, for libel or for, for fraud? Uh, no, it's, it's part of that accepted marketing jargon in the industry. But to be fair and to be clear here, there are a lot of gray areas with respect to, you know, the, the lines being approached and kind of crossed and maybe crossed um, in that boundary, again, between puffery and objectionably verifiable statements that could lead to some misrepresentation that is critical, right? So interesting um, analysis by the court here is the court says, this is not something we're going to hold their feet to the fire on because how would you even begin to to prove or disprove a statement like Farfetch is a technology company at its core? Again, what does that mean, right? Uh, how would I, what would I have to show you if I owned Farfetch to show that that statement is is objectionably verifiably true uh, versus false. We, we can't even really define 
what a technology company is first, because it's such an ambiguous term. And then at its core, what does that mean? Uh, more than 51% of my business has to be technology oriented, but what is technology oriented? I mean, it's a third party platform and it operates on the web and through smart apps. So does that mean it's technology? Uh, it becomes very, very ambiguous and difficult to pin down. And that's why I suspect the court dismissed this claim and said, you know what, this is not, this is not actionable. Um, so yet another one down, the, the plaintiffs are, are zero and three at this point, right? Um, so another Securities Act claims statements about their growth strategies. So looking at projections for the future and the, the goals for the company and the ways in which they set about to achieve those goals, right? What are the plans for achieving them? So the materials uh, in the prospectus and the registration statements included uh, growth strategy and plans for acquisitions. Um, including that it planned to, among other things, improve consumer economics, grow consumer base, increase supply of seller base, invest in new technologies, and build the brand, and use corporate proceeds to fund new acquisitions. So there is a, a disclosure right here, right, that, that is conceded that the acquisitions were a stated part of the intention for growth and, uh, and development of the business and invest aggressively in research and development and grow the brand across geographies and categories, right? So physical space and consumer markets and within brand products um, and development. So in terms of growth strategies, uh, plaintiffs alleged against shareholders that these were false because they created the misleading impression that the company would invest in its third party technology platform, that that was the focus. In reality, the, the shareholders say Farfetch was actually planning at the time of the IPO to achieve growth by buying more high-risk, capital-intensive first-party sales platforms, which, as we previously discussed, they ultimately did. And depending on who you talk to, may have ultimately been one of the biggest causes behind the, the tanking of the company in August of 2019. Right, so plaintiff used the facts to try to establish that Farfetch wasn't really serious about moving away from the first party commerce model. So they're saying that all of that was a ruse, right? That that was the fraudulent element. Um, lots of circumstantial evidence indicates, to be fair to the shareholders, that at the time of the IPO, Farfetch was planning to make significant acquisitions of first party commerce platforms. So that, in other words, there's evidence that they knew that that was part of the plan. The question becomes, were their disclosures and the information they provided in the prospectus and the registration statement, was that fair? in light of this plan, right? Did they, did they do a fair job of accurately describing their intentions moving forward? So court's analysis here, the court ruled that even if it was established that Farfetch was at the time of the initial public offering planning to make significant acquisitions of first party commerce platforms, that doesn't make its statements false or misleading, right? So this is not a good day for plaintiffs. Um, First, internal discussions are not the same thing as a definitive plan, right? So there, there's nothing locked in about this, that the, these were conversations and not, um, you know, contractual obligations of the, of the company to its shareholders or to anybody else. Uh, second, acquisitions were referenced in the materials as a growth strategy, right? So again, it was disclosed. It was mentioned specifically. Third, it specifically mentioned that the timing and volume of the spending for acquisitions depends on many factors and that the company retains broad discretion to make the decisions, right? So uh, that there's a lot of dynamics involved in business is known among anybody who's ever been in business, right? The fact that at the time of the IPO, we might say, you know, yes, we're planning on doing X, Y, and Z, and then things change and we're forced to adapt. Can you imagine if you were a housing company or a construction company or a real estate mortgage company, a bank at any point, and, and, and you were launching an initial IPO in 2007, right? Just before the 2008 bubble burst housing crisis, subprime mortgage loan crisis that completely turned the, the housing residential construction market and, and housing uh, lending and real estate market upside down, right? Can you imagine how different your plans would be in 2009 as compared with your projections for what you'd be doing in 2009 as of 2007, right? So the point is things can change and they can change rather quickly. So the, the court's sort of empathy with the, the company here is to say that, you know, there's a lot of variables that determine what you're going to be doing and, uh, and timing and, and supply and demand and all of that comes into play in assessing where you're ultimately going to be. But none of this is to suggest that the statements made in the prospectus should be considered, you know, unbreakable promises, right? 
And finally, the company has every right to change its business plans and strategies without disclosing those changes, right? That, that, that is part and parcel of what it is to run a business that they can do that. Um, this does not make the original statements of strategy necessarily false, right? So the court is, is very receptive to the autonomy of Farfetch here. You can, you can see that just bleeding out of every opinion. And I'm not saying the court is biased in any way. I'm just saying you can see that the court is certainly pro uh, business autonomy and discretion. They certainly appreciate and, and practice the business judgment rule that we discussed way back at the beginning. Um, and one final point of uh, a theory of liability that the court entertained here, another Securities Act claim. This one was statements about promotional activities and performance metrics. So this is another attack on Farfetch to say you were misleading, but this one is with respect to the promotional activities and performance metrics uh, disclosures in those statements. So the materials included uh, statements, again, prospectus in the registration statement uh, that were alleged to be false by the shareholders. Uh, promotional incentives and discounts may be offered periodically to consumers was was part of the disclosure. Um, and the shareholder said that they engaged in this constant promotional activity that was hurting the company's bottom line. So they're basically saying, well, you said you were going to do this periodically, which we would interpret to mean perhaps occasionally. And yet you made this like the, the status quo. It was the rule, not the exception. And that that hurt the bottom line, the profits in such a way that this is why the company had to report such large losses. That's what the shareholders are saying. Um, they're also saying it set uh, that the, the statements set operating and financial metrics based primarily on earnings, but the shareholders allege that the discounts from the promotional activities were hidden as costs, thereby hurting the earnings metrics that it established for itself. So this is kind of a, a question of, do we look at metrics of gross revenues or revenues after costs, right? Earnings before interest taxes depreciation, amortization, EBITDA, right? That kind of thing. So what metrics are you looking at and how are you measuring yourself? And the shareholders are criticizing that by saying, you're looking at the wrong stuff. And, and not, not only that, but you're deceiving us because when you measure yourself based on earnings and you set a goal for yourself, you say, oh, wow, wow we achieved that goal. That's great. But you have these promotional discounts that you're including in almost every sale, right? According to, to the angle that the shareholders are are seeming to suggest here that then you deduct from costs and we're really not making any money at all because you're measuring before you consider all of that, right? And they're saying, if you're going to look at earnings, look at earnings after the promotional discounts, because that's really what matters. Um, that's, that's their key argument here. So it's, you know, it's essentially if we were to say, well, you know, we made a million dollars last year in gross revenues at, you know, I don't know, some restaurant we own or something. Okay, great. But once we deduct food and labor costs and, you know, all the other overhead, we made nothing, right? In fact, we owe more than we made, right? Well, that's so, you know, to say that we made a million dollars sounds great, but then when you look at it after everything is considered, it's not great at all. And so that's the key argument here. Um, and then of course, shareholders allege similar other sleight of hand tricks to hide costs and expenses in a manner that did not hurt the revenue benchmark so that they were they were prompting up this this uh, revenue benchmark as the the measure of performance and then looking at everything later in such a way that it deceived investors that's the key argument on this line of of uh, this theory of liability so uh Court's analysis, the language of promotions would be offered periodically. Again, here's another ambiguous term. What does the term periodically mean? What does that word mean, right? Does it have something definite? Of course not, right? There's, there's, no, there's no precise measurement for something that is periodic, right? So they're saying it could have been misleading, but no reasonable investor could have been misled into believing that the company would never engage in promotional activities, right? I mean, the very fact that they said that we would do this periodically would denote, I mean, clearly beyond a shadow of a doubt, not never, right? Sometimes. Now, how much, how often? That's a matter of debate and interpretation, but certainly not never. And they didn't say they would never do it. Uh, Farfetch was actually quite open about the possibility of a need to be aggressive and utilize promotions to grow the under, uh, underdeveloped luxury fashion industry, right? So they were, according to the court's analysis, pretty clear about that. So they're reading periodically to be pretty liberal in this respect. And with regard to performance metrics, again, defendants are entitled to make their own decisions about how to establish benchmarks and no reasonable investor would believe that the metrics used would account for promotional expenses. So they're saying it's unreasonable to suggest that gross revenue would factor in promotional expenses. That always comes after you deduct your costs so that it's not reasonable to suggest that it should have. 
Uh, if the investors didn't like the metrics used to measure the success of the company, their remedy would be to simply not invest. So the, the court is basically saying, look, if, if you didn't like the way that they ran their accounting and set their goals for themselves, there's an easy remedy to that. Just don't buy their stock. Um, but you knew all this ahead of time. You had, in other words, sort of a, a full disclosure, and yet you invested anyway. So you know the court is unsympathetic to these arguments. So ultimately, uh, with respect to these analyses, the court ruled that the offering materials disclosed uh, cost of the promotional activities, the risk of having to increase those promotional activities, the correct descriptions of all the metrics used and the appropriate explanations for them. Plaintiffs did not properly allege fraud or false or misleading registration statements or prospectus. Therefore, defendant's motion for summary judgment is granted and the complaint was dismissed. Um, I don't know if it was dismissed with prejudice or without. It's tangential to the to the case here, but this is one example where an MSJ or, or in this case, a 12B6 uh, motion to dismiss was granted uh, on the grounds that, again, after a thorough analysis from the court, they couldn't find anything that was suggestive of, of a plausible road to success for the plaintiffs, even assuming everything factually in a light most favorable to that which you know the plaintiffs were alleging, uh, that there was nothing here on which they could grant relief. And so for that reason, they dismissed the complaint. So I hope this was a useful overview for you. Appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next time for another great video. Take care.